Hello everyone, this is Monica, your host for the Business of Bridal Sewing podcast, and here we are at episode number three where we are going to talk about adjusting our prices, mostly in the upward direction, (laughs) almost always in the upward direction. I am so excited for this episode today for many reasons, not the least of which is because I get to geek out on fashion psychology, which I mean, if I could draw heart eyes in a podcast, I would draw them with a little Cupid heart right next to those two words. I love fashion psychology almost as much as I love brides and wedding dresses. So today is going to be a fun one for me. So to start off our conversation about adjusting our prices, I want to move away from the usual approach, which is more about like supply and demand. Instead of asking, can I raise my prices? Will brides pay that much if I raise my prices up there? I want to ask instead, who is my target bride and why will she love investing her time and money with me for her custom bridal dress or bridal alterations? We're going to take more of a business strategy approach. My philosophy is that there are more than enough brides for each of us and there are so few seamstresses, which creates an advantage in that there's room in this market for us to position ourselves in a way that is authentic authentic to ourselves, to our unique perspectives, to the way we work, and that provides value to our brides and our custom design clients. So let's get started with the good stuff. (laughs) We're going to look into fashion psychology to understand the way that brides make their buying decisions and then apply that to their decision to work with us and pay the prices that we ask. There are a lot of different criteria that a consumer would consider when making an apparel purchasing decision. We'll discuss a few here that are particularly applicable to the bridal industry and our current topic. The first of which is pricing. (laughs) This is probably the number one, the one that we always think about. Um, It's the one we're most familiar with. It is definitely a key factor in almost every buying decision, and it is easily quantifiable, by which I mean that it can be considered and discussed in concrete terms, i.e. prices, budgets. It's very helpful in making decisions because it's very clear and you can set boundaries for yourself. But price is rarely the sole criteria for apparel purchasing decisions, and it combines with other criteria in various ways. For example, let's look at our second criteria, which is quality. Consumers often balance both price and quality when making their decisions. For example, a customer may not mind a lower quality item if they are paying a lower price, or they may be willing to pay a much higher price for a higher quality item. The balance of a good price for a good quality is what we would consider a good value. The next few criteria are often related, but not necessarily interchangeable. They are the different categories of desirability. The first of which is fashionability, or what is most fashionable at the time. There is a cycle of fashion called the fashion adoption cycle, which follows a particular style through the different stages of fashionability. In the earlier stages, fewer, more fashionable consumers adopt the style which feels new and fresh, and then as more and more people purchase the items that are categorized by that style, the popularity expands, leading eventually to mass acceptance. Then, as the style becomes so widely available and has been around for a long time, the style becomes less acceptable in that it's kind of seen as passe or dated until it is completely unfashionable. Fads move through the cycle really quickly and classics are styles that can pass slowly through the cycle or that maintain a level of mass acceptance and never get to the point of being unacceptable. There are also considerations when thinking about fashionability that are more towards personal style, which may vary from the general fashionability of the general public. A consumer's personality and particular interests can affect their buying decisions, leading them to make purchases that differ from what the rest of the world is doing. This is often a very important consideration for brides when purchasing their wedding dresses, because many a bride chooses her dress that fits 
them or fits their personal vibe or shows off their own personality rather than following just what is most trendy or fashionable at the time. Have you ever heard a bride's entourage say, oh my gosh, that dress is so you. This is what we're talking about. There are also brides for whom social cachet is a consideration in their purchase. Apparel is often an identifier of membership in a certain social circle or a financial status, and consumers who desire that social cachet are often willing to pay a higher price or even a much higher price for goods that would probably be considered a similar quality, but one offers more social cachet than the other. Designer labels, luxury goods, these are hallmarks of this category. In contrast, the criteria of uniqueness seeks to set the customer apart from others rather than considering them as members of a group. Many brides don't want to wear dresses that look similar to what their friends or sisters wore on their wedding day or what they've seen over and over again in their magazines. A lot of brides are kind of around the same age and their friends are around the same age and they seem to all get married at the same time. And the last thing that she wants is to look just like her friend who just got married. The last criteria is the experience of the consumer as they make their buying decision, not even related to the dress that she's buying, but the experience that she has when she's buying the dress. And that experience we know means a lot to brides. It means a lot to their family members. It's a very special moment in the lead up to the most important day of their lives. The experience for the customer includes the level of customer service that they receive and the physical environment of the store, which includes the interior design, the music that plays, the overall vibe of the shop. The brides often purchase dresses from shops and from sales staff that they identify as having similar characteristics of themselves or characteristics which they aspire to, which means They buy from people that they like, that they feel that they're like, or people that they want to be like. To see how these factors interact with each other, let's use the example of buying a t-shirt. If you wanted to pay the lowest price for a t-shirt that you could, you'd probably go down the street to that store that's in every town across America with the very lowest prices, the blue and yellow, and buy a t-shirt. It will be the most inexpensive t-shirt you could probably find, and it will also likely be low quality. It'll probably be in the mass adoption stage of the fashion cycle, so it won't be fashionable for long, but since it's low quality, it probably won't last very long anyways. You could also go and buy a shirt from that store with the red circle and the red dot, which we all love. (laughs) And generally, Target, as I like to call it, has low prices, but also positions itself as a lifestyle brand. When you buy something from Target, you kind of have this feeling that you're like a hip mom who's living a life full of intention and purpose. It for sure has a vibe. I don't know about you, I can go to Target in a t-shirt and buy a t-shirt at Target, but I will probably put on mascara (laughs) and I will dress my kids super cute before I go. I will not do the same thing if I am going to Wally World. I love me a $10 t-shirt from Target, but I also know that I will likely run into someone else, perhaps maybe in the line for the Matterhorn at Disneyland. Yes, that's totally happened to me, wearing the same $10 Target t-shirt. Good quality, good value, Definitely a vibe, low uniqueness. If you buy a t-shirt from a department store, you're likely to find high quality for a higher price, probably more fashion forward styles, not particularly unique, but does come with a higher social cachet. You can take a good old t-shirt and scribble a brand name across the front, maybe in nearly illegible letters that start with an M and charge an exorbitant amount of money. Yes, I am looking at you, Massimo t-shirt. And yes, I did just totally date myself, totally from the 90s. (laughs) If you're looking for something that is less common, either that is more fashion forward earlier on the fashion adoption cycle, or something that lies in a niche, like maybe a t-shirt from a ticket particular band or a fandom that you like, yes, I'm still totally a nerd, you'll likely end up shopping at a boutique either in person or online. 
Boutiques are smaller, which allows them to be targeted towards a specific niche or a very specific customer. There is often a higher price, but also high uniqueness and high desirability and likely good quality as well. This all translates to the bridal industry. So let's look at the different types of bridal shops where our brides purchase their gowns. If price, specifically a low price, is a main concern, a bride might want to go to that big box bridal store. You know the one we all know and sometimes have a love-hate relationship with. <laughs> there she will find a low-priced dress with cute styles, generally in the middle of the fashion adoption cycle. Probably not the worst quality, but often very simpler construction, less uh, structure on the inside, and often with a sales staff that is working with lots of brides at one time, which kind of leaves our brides with a so-so customer experience that's based more on efficiency rather than service. Definitely a viable choice if those are her criteria. But if a bride is looking for a higher quality gown or something that is more desirable in terms of fashionability and especially social cachet, she might want to go to the name brand bridal salons, such as that one that is in that show that we all know, the one where the brides fly to New York from all over the U.S. just to be one of their brides. They get the glam experience and the ability to say that they are a bride from such and such store. It gives you a well-known identity as a fashionable and affluent bride. Many brides, however, purchase their dresses from bridal boutiques. Most bridal shops are actually bridal boutiques. They're smaller and they can focus on a specific niche or a target customer. This might be a high-end shop that offers designer gowns and a fabulous experience. They also often offer, <laughs> that's a tongue twister, <laughs> they also often offer customizations either through their in-shop alterations department or directly from the designers and manufacturers that allow the bride to get a customized version of a designer's dress um, for a little bit of an extra price. This leads to a fabulous experience that the bride has, high uniqueness, high price point, um, or your boutique could be a shop that caters more to a specific style, like a boho bride or like an uber modern bride, or that has a specific position in the marketplace. For example, there's like this super cute little shop in my town that sells vintage wedding dresses as a move towards like more sustainable fashion industry practices by reducing the amount of gowns that are produced and thus reducing the amount of fashion waste that the world is left to deal with. Um, I love vintage dresses. I love vintage redesigns and their shop is super cute. So that's right up my alley and sustainability is kind of like a super bonus and all of that. Um, there's lots of documentaries on Netflix <laughs> about that. You should totally watch them all. Um, boutiques that fill a niche like that attract brides that are looking for something that fits their personal style over what is widely available and widely fashionable. It offers uniqueness, quality, personality, and vibe, and does so with a variety of price points. Some of them are higher price point, some of them are pretty affordable, but it's that uniqueness and that personality that really attracts the brides. Success for each of these different shops depends on focusing on a specific target market, identifying the bride's criteria for making those purchases, and structuring their businesses in a way that supports those purchase criteria. The same holds true for us as bridal sewists, both designers and alteration specialists. We'll want to select a specific target market and structure our businesses to support that market and those criteria that they use to make their purchasing decisions. For example, if you focus on a budget bride and offer the lowest prices for your alterations in your area, you'll want to set up your business for efficiency. This can include scheduling 
shorter times with your brides during fittings, scheduling your fittings back to back to make better use of your time and to make sure that your fitting time doesn't interrupt your sewing time. You may also consider focusing more on standard or simpler alterations and say no to brides with more complicated or time-consuming alterations. If you select a higher price point bride, then experience is going to be your byword, both your experience and the experience you offer to your bride. Your bride will want to work with only the best because she will be trusting you with a dress that she not only paid a lot of money for, but is going to be the most important garment that she wears on the most important day of her life. So your marketing efforts will want to reflect that positioning. You may also want to look for ways that you can offer the glam experience through your hospitality, through the interior design of your workspace, and even down to decisions like having a larger fitting area that has room for all of your bride's besties and mom and soon to be mom-in-law and her second cousin once removed that's just like her sister and they grew up together. You could also offer different services as an add-on to their alterations, like a day of wedding dressing services or different things like that that will enhance her experience as a whole. You can spend more time with this bride, but you get more value from the transaction for yourself and you offer more value to your bride through the transaction as well. Our strategy then is to identify a target customer, determine their pricing criteria, and enhance our desirability by focusing on those criteria in our businesses and in our marketing. Remember that value is a function of price and the quality of goods and services you offer. To offer a greater value to your clients, you don't have to offer them the lowest price. You have to offer them the most for their money. Your prices should match the value that you're offering to your brides. So let me give you an example of how this focus on a specific target market and matching my prices to that target market has benefited me in my business. Now, don't get jealous, but I have the best relationship with the best bridal shop in my town. They have the most authentic, genuine, caring sales staff who are so knowledgeable and they sell, honestly, guys, the most adorable dresses that ever existed. They're beautiful, they're feminine, they're unique, they're not just like every other dress. Honestly, it is always a beautiful surprise when I open a dress bag from this bridal shop because the dresses are so gorgeous. They also specifically do a very good job of educating their brides because they talk to the brides when they are selling wedding dresses about the different kind of alterations options that are possible. They talk to their brides when they are ordering a specific size about what kind of alterations they might need. And they specifically mention me by name and direct to me brides that need my specific skills and expertise. They often send me a lot of their brides that need rebuilds or customizations or anything that has any sort of tricky pattern making element. They have other seamstresses that focus on different things. But what that leads to is brides showing up to me who are excited to do business with me. I am the best fit for them. They trust me because of the reputation that I have built with this bridal shop. And they are excited for the experience of continuing that same level of customer service, that same level level of love and caring that started in that bridal shop with me through the whole experience of alterations. Another key aspect of this relationship is the price point. As amazing as this shop is, as beautiful as their dresses are, they are actually not the highest price point boutique in my area. They're also not the lowest. Their prices run probably most dresses between $1,500 and $4,000. So it's kind of like really a medium price point. But I found that this kind of middle ground, this perfect balance of price has given me brides that are expecting to pay for the alterations that they need. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't get to live 
every day in this beautiful, magical, mystical land where every bride is perfect for me and I am perfect for every bride. I do have brides that I turn away for different reasons. And I do have brides that, you know, end up falling in the uh, learning experience category. But since I have focused on this very specific target market, this specific price point of customers that matches my price point that I want to charge in my business, I have a much higher ratio of transactions that end up with a very happy bride and a very happy seamstress. So beyond matching your prices to your target market bride, here are some other reasons why you might want to raise your prices. If you have kind of a good thing going right now and you have like a nice balance now, but you have some savings goals that you need to make for your business, let's say you need to invest in an industrial machine or you want to make the next step to getting a brick and mortar shop, a way that you can accomplish those goals is to kind of keep your business running at the at the rate that it is now with your expenses and everything, but to raise your prices a bit and take that extra profit and set it aside to build your business in the future. If you don't already have enough room to set some savings aside just in the way that things are now, you really need to get to the point where you can do that. Nobody's business stays static. There are always things that come up and having that business asset, that liquid funds to be able to accomplish your dreams and also be able to handle things that come up. Let's say your sewing machine breaks down and needs repair, those kinds of things. That's going to give you the financial stability to keep your business afloat in times when it otherwise might have to close. Another thing that you might want to take into consideration is that you deserve a raise. (laughs) If you are a business owner, a lot of times we don't think about raises, but we are our own bosses. So in the regular working world, if you had a regular nine to five, there would usually be a set schedule for regular pay raises, even if they're modest, to cover even just the cost of living and inflation that increases. And we often get a larger wage increase by going to a new job or by getting a different position in different things. So if your business is growing, you should give yourself a raise. I am a big believer, even if you get to the the beautiful place where you feel like your prices are enough to honor you and the work that you put into your work and also honor the value that your bride gets out of your work. I'm still a big believer in giving yourself a little bit of a price increase each year just to cover those kinds of things. So now that we've talked about all the reasons why we want to raise our prices, let's talk about a few of the reasons why we may not want to or feel that we cannot raise our prices. So one of the most common worries I think we have is that, is there going to be enough brides who want to pay the price that we want to charge? And I think we have kind of assumed that almost every bride is very focused on price and especially focused on a low price. But I think you would be surprised as I was when I increased my prices in a significant way a while back. I expected to have at least some pushback or to have more conversations with brides who didn't have the budget for the alterations that I was giving. But I actually had none. (laughs) I did not have that conversation. At the end of every initial fitting, I always give my brides their estimate and I ask if that estimate falls within their budget so that we can have open conversation. If it doesn't, we can come up with an alternate plan or figure out something so that I am not asking the bride to extend beyond her budget, but she's not asking me to do work that I'm going unpaid for. And it almost never comes up that it doesn't fit within her price range. I think we assume that so many more brides have a lower budget than we think that they do or that pricing is their number one criteria when it's not, when they are focused on other things like making sure they have the best seamstress for their alterations. I think another worry that I hear a lot is that there is competition out there in their local area who is less expensive. And honestly, that's fine. 
that is a okay. It is perfectly fine to be the most expensive <laughs> seamstress or alterations shop in your area. You don't want to be far and away much more expensive than everyone else. You want to be charging a fair price for your um, geographic market, but it's okay to be the most expensive spot. Brides will often judge your quality based off of your price. It kind of sets their expectations. Um, in back going back to the psychology of fashion, if your prices are too low, sometimes people will question your quality. If your prices are higher, then customers have an expectation that you are able to charge that price because of the skills and the value that you offer. If you do end up being the more expensive person in your market area, that could be good for the other seamstresses in your area that could move up the market price and benefit everyone. Kind of like in real estate, where if your neighbor's house sells for a really good price, that increases the value of your own house. Another thing to take into consideration is whose prices you are looking at. There is probably a good portion of the seamstresses in your market that don't post their prices for all to see and they often will be the shops and the seamstresses who have more experience and who are charging a higher price. So I would expect that fair market price is actually a little bit higher than the collective price that you can find posted online. So the third hesitation that I often hear is that, oh, I can't raise my prices. I can't charge that because I am fill in the blank. I am too young, I am too old, I work from home, etc., etc. So there's a lot of ways in which we kind of disqualify ourselves and compare ourselves to others. And all you need to know is that you are amazing. And everything that makes you you adds to the package that is your unique voice and your unique position in the market. If you are young, then position yourself as a hip, creative person who knows what's going on. You are a young entrepreneur. You are a women-owned business, if you are a women-owned business. <laughs> If you are feeling like you are too old, then position that yourself by leaning into the experience cachet. The older a seamstress is, the more a bride assumes that she has decades of experience. I personally lean into this one by playing up the fact that I have gray hair and dressing a little bit older <laughs> for my fittings than I do in my regular life. Um, I also do fittings from home. You guys, I definitely feel this. It feels sometimes like you are less professional if you do fittings from home compared to if you do them at a bridal shop or if you have a brick and mortar store. But you can lean into that and make that part of your customer experience. Give yourself an authenticity. Lean into the hospitality of having somebody in your home, inviting them into your home and building that relationship with your customers. We'll have more in a later episode on how to run a professional business from home, but for now, just know that it is part of what makes you unique and it is a benefit that you are offering to your brides. Now, the last one, I saved it for last because honestly, I think it is the biggest hesitation that we have, the biggest hindrance, the biggest reason why we don't wanna raise our prices because we don't want to feel greedy. <laughs> we don't want to feel like we're taking advantage of anyone or that we are raising our prices just because we can to get more money out of our brides. That's not who we are. That's not what we're doing here. First of all, modern culture doesn't really leave a lot of room for balance. It's all either me, 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 <laughs> or you, 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 you. <laughs> There's a here's my prices, you can take it or leave it kind of attitude. And Honestly, that's beneficial sometimes, especially if you have a bride that is not respecting your boundaries, not respecting your prices. You can kind of use that to your advantage and be like, look, here's where I'm at. If you cannot meet me here, then I am not the seamstress for you. There is the other side of that by putting ourselves at a disadvantage because we feel like it is our job to solve a bride's problems. Many brides come to us uneducated about the alterations experience. They don't know how much money they should have saved or how much time they should have saved for their alterations. 
And we love them. We love all of our brides. And if you're like me, you have a bleeding heart and want to fix everybody's problems. But it's not to our best interest. It's actually a disadvantage to our brides as well if we try and solve their problems for them. Our job is to offer them what we have available to them and let them make the choice if they want to continue with us or look for a solution elsewhere. And also just by the the fact that you're worrying about being greedy is a sign that you probably are not greedy. <laughs> Our number one job is not to stitch dresses, but to serve brides, which means that we need to educate our brides and craft an agreement that works for both us and our bride. If it's in her best interest to go elsewhere, whether that's for money or somebody who has a different specialty than us, or just their needs don't match up with what we have to offer, then give her a referral and trust yourself and the boundaries that you've set up for yourself. Um, I do have some suggestions in episode two about offering alternative solution for brides who want to work with you and that you want to work with, but your alterations don't fit into their budget. So go check that out if you haven't yet. So there's no need to feel greedy. (laughs) Trust your intentions. If you are making this decision with the best of intentions to try and find a balance of what is good for you and also good for your bride, and by offering a valuable service to your bride and honoring the work that you put into the dress and honoring the money that your bride is paying to you, then you will make a good decision. If you're still worried about it, then move your prices up incrementally until you find that sweet spot, until you find that balance. And if you pass it, if you find that you're losing brides or that you feel like you're charging too much money or that what you're offering doesn't match that price, then you can always step back some. But you'll never know where that spot is unless you go looking for it. So maybe by now you're like, yes, Monica, I am on board. I am picking up what you're laying down, but how in the world do I do this? (laughs) Well, if you built a price list, if you already have a price list or you were with us for episode number two, you can take your price list and just apply a certain percentage to it. You can increase your prices by a certain percentage rate. You also, if you are finding that the work that you're putting into stitching is reflective in your pricing, but that all of the other hours that you spend on your brides is not reflective of your pricing, you might just want to add a certain dollar amount to each ticket, kind of have like a base price that covers your fittings, your admin time, and that kind of stuff. So you can raise it by a certain dollar amount. You can raise it by a certain percentage. And if you're asking when to raise your prices, right now, (laughs) do it with your very next bride. If you do not have published prices that your customers can see in advance, then just start with your next bride. You'll keep track on your alterations ticket or your custom design contract, what price you have charged to each customer. So you'll just reference that when you're talking to your customers. If you do have prices published either online or in person, I would take those offline um, until all of the brides that you have at your older price point are all worked through and have completed. And then when all of the brides that you're working on are all, or in the future, are all at your new price point, then put up your new prices either online or in person with your brides so that all of your current brides all have the same price if they're published or widely available. So that's it. Now you know, first of all, why you would want to increase your prices, how to define your target market customer, why they would choose you, and how to create a pricing structure that really reflects the value that you offer to your brides and that will make them excited to work with you as well. So now I want to hear from you. What other questions do you have about pricing that we haven't addressed yet? Or what is your best advice when it comes to pricing? Like I said in the introduction for this season, I really want this to be a place where we can all come together and learn from each other so that we can each be teachers and learners together. There is a place for advice and also questions. We're all experts in some ways and novices in others. (laughs) So please share all your advice. I love learning from all of you and I am so glad to be a part of this industry and this tradition where we have 
to learn from each other and learn hand to hand and voice to voice from others in our community. So have a beautiful day and happy stitching.